Good evening. Okay, we got to act like this is a big crowd. Good evening. Is that the best you got? Good evening. All right. Thank you, guys. I thought it was going to be much hotter than this, although this is not cool. But uh, when I looked at my outdoor thermostat at home, it said 90, and I thought, oh, my gosh. So I don't know whether it's just hotter because I'm up on that hill or it was sitting out in the sun. But I was really relieved when I got here. It said 74. So we're good. All right. Um, we'll jump right in. Do you guys have anything in the back before we get started? I'll give you, after the service, an understanding of why we are where we are with the AC and why we still don't have AC in the second week. There is a good reason. We're not just <laughs> slow on the draw, okay? And I'll, I'll tell you guys all about it. And uh, do what? We, we just want to know how bad you want Jesus. I'm tired of hearing about Zayshon and Asif having to sit on the floor in, in 120 degrees and everybody still shows up. And I want to see what y'all were made of. Obviously, we're a little softer. So, <laughs> okay. Um, the only prayer request that I have, I'm not going to throw a lot out there. I'm going to try to get you guys home. Uh, Emily is going on the 9th, right, to uh, get her plan with the cancer and the treatments that she will be receiving. So I do ask you guys to be in prayer for her. And uh, also, especially for Daisy, uh, she's, she's not been back since she started her treatments. And she said she may or may not, depending on how weak she was. And the one day that I did get to talk with her, she was feeling pretty bad. So once her treatments are over, we're hoping to get to see her because she will be out of work for some time. So please be in prayer for her as well. Uh, and if you guys will stand, we'll open up in prayer. Yes, sir. I talked about Tammy, my secretary's mother-in-law yes. last week. And what happened is she broke her hip. And then the, the repair they did to her hip started moving. Well, on Monday, they actually replaced the hip. and Replaced the same hip again? Yes. Okay. Replace and the hip replacement. They also biopsied the mass they found in her pelvis that they thought might be cancer and found out that it was not cancerous. So when I talked with you last week, they were pretty sure it was cancerous, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's why I wanted to share this. That's, That's awesome. Know. And actually, she's going home tomorrow unless things change. And she's how old? 93. 93. Well, how is she mentally? Yeah. What's that? How is she mentally? Oh, she has dementia. Yeah, it's not good. But going home means going home with Jamie and her husband. And if that's your condition, being home is the best thing in the world to keep you connected. Well, it's not going to be the home she's used to, so. So she's got a lot of changes in there. Okay, gotcha. Um, for those of you that were not here this week, I'll throw out there, because you just reminded me of that, uh, Glenna Griggs. Um, she had her test results back, and she does not have cancer. She still has to have mesh put in to hold her bladder, so she's got a lot ahead of her. But, my gosh, uh, as bad as that is, it's so awesome to hear that this didn't come on because of cancer. So, uh, what, what is the little lady's name that, that had the hip replacement? Mrs. Glover. I don't okay. know her first we don't know her. This is All right. All right. You guys are staying with me. <coughs> Richard, how are you doing, brother? You're my hero. <laughs> All right. And Tim, I'm glad to see you back. I know you guys have been through so much. How things go at Gilbert? Uh, very interesting. I can't wait to hear. All right. Oh. We just we just went down to the basement to kind of lunch down at the front tunnel down there. So, but it's not until the fifth, sixth, and seventh of October. We'll okay. Sixth and seventh. All right. Gotcha. 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 Um, is the mic turned up loud enough with all the fan noise? 
You guys hear me okay? Okay. I'm taking that as a yes, or else you didn't hear me when I asked you, could you hear me? I don't know. Okay, good. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, and Lord, I just open by, Lord, you know all that's on my heart. I just give myself to you, and I pray that all my brothers and sisters will do the same thing. I praise you for this cool evening. I praise you, Lord, that we get to meet, that we're free to speak, free to worship, free to love you. Help us never take it for granted. I pray, Lord, you'd move on all of our hearts, first and foremost, to just get close to you tonight. Let us sing with real joy, real thanks, real love, real intimacy. Let the Holy Spirit fill us to do what we cannot do. Let, Lord, your message come from you tonight and touch myself and every person here and every person that gets to hear it. And, Lord, the people that we have mentioned here, we lift up to you now as brothers and sisters, all in unison. We lift up Emily and we lift up Daisy. And Lord, I ask you to move mightily on them, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Claim the blood of Jesus Christ over them. And Lord, I thank you so much for Miss Glover and all that's happened there. And I praise you, Lord, for Glenna and how you've protected. And I ask you to be with both of them and all that they're going through. Lord, we lift up Mike Spencer. We lift up Jim and Valerie Gabehart. Lord, I lift up Richard and Joan and the unspoken and all the things that are going on in their life. And I lift up Tim and Laura and all that's going on in their life. And Lord, lastly, I lift up my brother Don. I ask you, Lord, to give him a fresh spirit, fresh strength. Keep him strong. And I praise you for all you brought him through. I pray you continue to use him mightily to keep his family grounded till the day that you come back. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give ourselves to you tonight. In Jesus Christ's precious name. And they all said, Amen.
Heavenly Father, help us be aware of your presence. Help us to be in reverence of you and your word and give you our full excitement and attention. Touch our hearts, Lord. Help us to see the times we're in and how dire it is to be close to you. In Christ's name we pray. And they all said, Amen. Guys, walking through scriptures is my favorite thing. And we're, gonna get, we're getting into the good stuff now, some of the best stories. Um, <clears throat> please begin to have the mindset anytime we're here, or even when you're alone, but especially where two or three are gathered, what? He's in their presence. Know that God is here. Know that this is his word. And give him your attention and open your heart. Let him speak to you what he wants to speak to you. Um, don't wait until tomorrow or next week or next month. This is the day you can get close. This is the day you can hear him. This is the day he can change things in your life. So we are in... Uh, we're actually getting ready to start in chapter 16, but we're going to catch the last part of chapter 15 because somebody got so long-winded last week that they didn't finish the chapter. But we ended at the perfect spot because what we're going to say now is going to roll right in. <clears throat> so let me find my right spot, and we're going to jump in. I think we'll be at chapter 15, verse 22. We're going to backtrack one verse so that it all fits together well. And I'm a, let me let you know how we got where we are. If you listen, say booyah. booyah. All right. Saul just attacked the Amalekites by God's command because the Amalekites have been some of the worst people in the land of Canaan, and they gave a horrible time to the Israelites uh, when they were first coming out of Egypt. And God swore then that when they went into, hi, Glenna, when they went into the land, and they became ADD, squirrel, and they became uh, a nation. God said, I will bring war to the Amalekites, and I will wipe them out, not just as revenge for what they did Israel, but because they had had 400 years to repent, and they had gotten so bad, they were devouring themselves, killing their own children, just lost as bad as things have gotten here in just this short time. They were so much worse, and God was just, they were beyond the point of return. So God had told him to go in and to destroy everything. And uh, Saul went in and did everything except take the king's life, uh, Agag, because he wanted him as a trophy. And he kept all the best oxen and sheep because he didn't want to destroy anything valuable. But everything else he tore up. And he went in and did exactly what God told him to do. And then on his way back, he was so pleased with himself and what he had done that he, he told his people to erect a monument of himself to celebrate. And it kind of sounds like Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't it, in Babylon. So uh, what was a lot worse than his sins and what we started on last week, and it's, my gosh, if we could get this, it wasn't his sins. It was the fact that when he was confronted with his sins, he said, oh, the people did it. And he said, oh, uh, no, actually, I'm righteous. I saved these animals because I want to sacrifice to your God, Samuel. And he tried to play the God card. You know how people will do that. He did everything except say, I'm so sorry. He did everything except want to be back with God. It was all about him and how he would look in front of the people if Samuel scolded him publicly. And uh, so he was totally unrepentant. And because of that, Samuel said, Saul, this day God has rejected you as king. Because you rejected to do what God said. Now, we left in the middle of this heated exchange. And it's getting ready to get real. Remember, Samuel's an old man, right? I love Samuel. Samuel just rocks. We meet so many people in First and Second Samuel that are awesome. Samuel says what needs to be said. He never backs down. And yet, he's got the softest, most easily broken heart for anybody, even sinners. He's just the perfect balance of everything that reflects God. And that's because he follows God closely. So, uh, this is where we pick up. And let me jump in from there. 15, verse 22. So Samuel said, this is where I'm retracking this one step because it's so important. And it's one of the biggest verses. Everybody knows it. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? In other words, do all you want to do and you can 
show it up and, and look like you're just so righteous in your actions, but he just wants you to obey him and show him you love him. <clears throat> Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of, lambs, of rams. For rebellion, now listen to what he compares it at. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as the iniquity, is as iniquity and idolatry. I love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Oh, he's downstairs. Then Samuel says, oh, sorry, Mark. It's because when Brenda's here, I, I can't even see you. Go with it. <laughs> so Samuel says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Uh, there's some real wisdom here, and I want you guys to get this. Uh, God doesn't, doesn't care what we can do. And, and I'm not going to recap everything I said last week, but I want you to listen to this. God doesn't care what we can do, how much we can give, how far we can go in our own skills. He cares about whether we give him our heart. So many people, so many ministries, so many Christians just look so perfect in their little family life and in all their wonderful, righteous ways, and their heart is so far from him. And do you think any of those righteous things means a hill of beans? And then that one guy on the streets that's just a total bum that finally realizes who he is and wants to obey God and love God and come to God looks more beautiful to God in that moment than anything that that sweet little family that's just putting on the acts of righteousness could ever do to look good to God. And the problem is that that's what we've been taught in church, and we've become so legalistic that that's what we think Christian life is. And it's not. It's what we went over Sunday. It has nothing to do with your, your relationship with God. All those things are wonderful if they're gifts to God because you love Him and agree with Him. But if you're just doing them because it's what you're supposed to do because you're a church person, get over yourself and realize you don't have a relationship with Him. And that's what he's trying to tell uh, Saul here. So things get real, really fast here. Listen to this response. This is where we left. This is the first new word we're going to read. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I've transgressed the commandments of the Lord and your words. Should have stopped right there. Good start. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. <clears throat> Okay, there you go again. You're starting to blame everybody but yourself. But then he goes on. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. You know what he's saying? Please go back with me because I don't want people to see that you're mad at me or to think that I look like I sinned against God. I want the people to think I look good. That's what he's saying. And you're going to see it, it grow even worse than that. There is absolutely no repentance here. And it, it gets even worse. And this is such, <laughs> it speaks so loud to us today. All right, here we go. Verse 27. And as Samuel turned around to go away, sorry, but Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Um, and as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel away from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel, this is, he's describing God, the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Then he said, listen to this answer that Saul gives. Then he said, I have, sin I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. So he did turn around and go back with him. Listen to what he says. Yes, I have sinned, but honor me now, please, before the people. Is that one iota of, Lord, I broke your heart. Lord, I got to get it right. Lord, what can I do to make this right? He does, all he cares about is, yes, I've sinned, but please don't make me look bad in front of these people. And, uh, I mean, tell me, tell me, please, if that really is any kind of repentance. Uh, he's, he's just saying, whatever you do, don't make me look bad. He's saying, uh, I'm sorry, now get over it 
and be nice to me in front of the people. And how many of you guys have ever been caught right in the middle of something you shouldn't have done as a kid or maybe even as an adult, and you're enjoying it, whatever you're doing. But when you get caught and the guilt hits you in front of the people, you're embarrassed, you completely fall apart. And you, you, you got the tears, you got the, the, the crying, moaning, I'm so sorry, and you're really not. Ten seconds ago, you were so excited about your sin. So here's what it means when you get that way. And I want you to listen because this is, this is the fake apology we started talking about last week. If because you're worried about getting punished, if because you're worried about how you're going to look to everybody now, if because you're worried about not getting blessings or not getting what you want and people not treating you right because they know what you did now, if that's what you're upset about and that's what's making you cry, which 90% of the time it is, then your entire apology was over nothing but self-pity and worry about you. It had nothing to do with repentance over the people that you hurt or hurting God. Does that make sense? That's exactly what Saul's doing here. And so you see this in kids a lot because they're not mature enough to understand it. But is it what you do? Is it what you do before God? Is it the reason you try not to sin? And when you do sin, is it the reason you come in repentance and beg God for forgiveness because you don't want to feel the hammer strike? You don't want to see the other shoe fall. You don't want anybody to find out what you did. That's not repentance. That's self-preservation. And we do it very often with our spouses, with our friends. Search your own heart because God sees your heart. God knows. Is it, is it really that you're just self-preserving or are you really sorry? And Saul absolutely didn't give a hoot. All he cared about was, whatever you do, please don't make me look bad in front of the people. And um, not one thing about falling away from God. This is why God chose David over Saul. Uh, David wasn't a saint, and I'm not going to go into all that again. But never, ever did David put his own reputation above getting close to God again when he would mess up. Many times he would eat the humble pie. Many times he would openly admit, declare. He wrote psalms about how much of a jerk he was. He never, ever cared about his reputation in front of anyone if it meant he could not come clean with God. And that's the way we should be. I really think one of the most awesome things, especially for a man, is to have to eat humble pie every now and then. So, I mean, if you're ever caught in, in making even just a mistake, not even a sin, guys are just broken. Oh, I have a record now. They know I'm not perfect. I'm, everybody's not going to look up to me now. Probably the best thing that could ever happen to you is to realize you're not in control and you're not all that and you're in subjection to God and the world doesn't revolve around you and your perfection. Be quick to say, no, I'm not all that, but my God is, and he loves me. And if you keep that mentality, you can stay close to God, and you will have all the anxiety relieved from you. And I'll tell you this. Are you listening? Say amen. If you will just openly admit when you have sinned with real, real heartbreak and repentance, you will have more respect and honor and love from that person than if you sat there and gave a thousand reasons why you were right. Or justified in what you did. Just learn that. Just openly say, I am so sorry that I hurt you. You are more important than me looking good. And watch and see how it restores you in their eyes. If we could just learn that. If we could. The biggest problem with every person in this room, because we live in this generation, so don't try to act like it's not all over you. We want to be the victim. We want to shift the blame. We want it to be somebody else's fault. We want to show we can take care of ourselves and I don't have to answer to anybody. And it is from the pits of hell. It makes you miserable and it keeps you from getting close to anybody and you will never, ever see things the way God does or walk with God as long as that's your mentality. So, Samuel does turn back. Here's where it gets really interesting. He does turn back and go with Saul and, and realize this. He's saying, hey, please come, come with me. Go back with me because I want to look good. And he's saying, go with me to worship. Do you realize he's asking Samuel to go back with him while they sacrifice the animals that he has because of his sin? And he's wanting Samuel to be part of it. But, so Samuel says, okay, I'll go back with you. But Samuel has a totally different reason for going back, which we're getting ready to see. Samuel is a spunky old man. I love him. All right, here we go. Verse 32. This is after they arrive. Samuel comes back with Saul. Then Samuel said, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. 
So Agag came to him cautiously. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past because all the killing and all the war and everything was all over. Now they were there to celebrate and worship. And the, the priest is coming up. And so Agag thinks, okay, I, at least I got out of this. But Samuel, verse 33, Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless, childless among women. And Samuel, this is, this is the original Hebrew very, very accurately, and Samuel hacked Agag into pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Now, some of your versions will say that he killed him. Uh, that's not a very clear description of what the original Hebrew said. The original Hebrew said he hacked him to death right there. So Samuel comes walking up to this guy who was supposed to be dead by God's command. This is the king's prized possession, right? Samuel walks up in front of the king and hacks this guy. This is an old man too. Hacks this guy to pieces in front of the king. And you know how Saul is. You know Samuel's taking a chance with his own life. So he hacks this guy to death in front of the king takes his trophy because it was supposed to have been done all along. Now, let me go ahead and finish reading this one part, but I just could I had to stop there and let you get a picture. If this was a movie, this would be the part where you tell the kids to hide themselves under the covers till it's over because it was tough. Verse 34. <clears throat> Then Samuel, now this is, this is the last thing that it says that happened. I mean, he tears this king apart. I'm, I'm sure he, like, dropped the mic. He drops the sword and he leaves, all right? Samuel went to Ramah. Saul went up to his house at Gil Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel, listen to this, went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. And we talked about that. It doesn't mean regret the way we're talking regret. It means that it, he was sad. He was heartbroken over how things had happened. Now, this is such a beautiful picture. I was telling you I love Samuel. Samuel told everything that he needed to tell Saul about this is what you did to God, and this is why the kingdom's going to be taken from you, and I'm going to correct your mistake with Agag. And then he leaves. He says, I'm done with you. God's done with you. This is over. So he goes back. Now it says they had no more communication until the day Saul died. So it was a long time. This is what I want you to get. Samuel was Saul's everything. They were, Samuel was the one that anointed Saul, made him someone when he was a nobody, made him king, brought him God's word, was his bestest friend. And he never, ever once after that ever tried to get in touch with Samuel. At any given time, through all the years that are represented here, Saul could have come to Samuel, could have come to God, and could have repented. Okay? At, it's even possible his kingdom could have been restored. He did it for David, didn't he? But at worst, he could have lost his kingdom but been restored for sure to God. And had everything. But here was the problem with Saul. It's the same problem we have. And I've seen it in people in this church through the 18 years I've been here. If you can't get what you want out of God, you don't want him at all. I've seen people where they have everything from God. They've seen God. They know God is real. He's blessed them in a thousand ways. And there's one thing in their life they feel they deserve. And God won't give it to them. So they're done with God. And they walk away from him. And they stay bitter against him. And this is what Saul has done. He's like, I'm not going to be repentant. I'm not going to chase after God because this kingdom is everything to me. And he's going to take it away from me. So he never repented. He never went to Samuel. But here's the thing. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. Um, Samuel, even though he knew what Saul had done, is the most beautiful picture of God. Because Samuel went back and he wasn't going to go to Saul and try to make it right because there was nothing to make right until Saul would ever, ever at least come to himself and repent, right? There's nothing he could do. But just like God, this is, oh my gosh, it's such a beautiful picture. When we turn our back on God, when we are unrepentant, when we're mad at God and we go off and there's complete silence, it's not because God left you. Because here's the picture. What's Samuel doing the whole time? He's mourning over Saul. He should be angry. He should be hating Saul. He, he ruined everything when he anointed him king. 
Samuel's heartbroken for Saul, even though Saul wants nothing to do with him. And you're going to see just how bad it gets over the years. That is a beautiful picture of God. And, and I, want you, I want you so bad to understand it. And I know somebody in here has got to wrestle with this the way that I do. And God has brought me a long ways. God does not stand far off and spit at you, even when your back is turned to him. Saul's back was turned, but Samuel was still broken for him, just like God is. It's a beautiful picture of who God is. He was just waiting for Saul to return, and he never did. But did Samuel say all the right things and butter him up to try to bring him back, even though he wasn't repentant? No. Would that have been loving Saul? No. He told Saul what he needed to hear. And yet, he was heartbroken, and he loved him. And that's a beautiful picture of God. Um, now, make sure I didn't miss anything here. I get ahead of myself because this is pretty good stuff. All right. We're going to move on from there. Now we'll move into 16, and this is where it gets really cool. I don't know how far I can go. Hopefully I can get through it. It's a short chapter. Verse 16. Now the Lord said to Samuel, this has been some time now, okay? How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. So God tells Samuel the morning is over. It's time to quit crying. Um, Here's why. Because even if we break God's heart, and even if God wanted to use us, the best of men and women that follow God, and we think we're God's gift to the, to the world, even if you are one of the most usable people and you're in the best, most prime place to be used, if your heart is not right with God, His program will go on without you. Even if He doesn't want it to. Because it was never you. He used you for your benefit. And if you're not willing to be close to him, you're not willing to be used, do you think you're all that? Not one of us is. He'll still love you, but he'll set you on the shelf and come by and pat you on the head every now and then because his will will be done with or without you. So don't think you've got the big boy britches on and God's following along in your trail happy that you're there. It's all God. And if we will realize that, we will continue to be used. So he's saying, hey, uh, Samuel, it's time for you to get up and move on. And I really want you to see this. Although it was a good thing that Samuel was broken. Are you listening to me? This is a point I want everybody to get because this is a big problem today. Samuel was broken and hurt and it was right because God was too. Um, but there came a time when God had to say, Samuel, Saul has made his choice. He's been given a chance to repent. He is not going to repent. If you sit here, and you whine, and you cry, and you worry about making him upset and appeasing him, then you care more about him than you do me and my will. And this is, this is what I, it's hard to say, but in the life that we're living today, you've got to get this straight. When someone that you love, family, spouse, friend, steps away from God. And I don't mean that they don't know God and they're sinning. I mean someone that knows God is real and they've stepped off into another lifestyle or into a sin um, that's just right flying in God's face and you know they're just flipping God off and saying, I'm going to do what I want. I see over and over again people that say, well, I got to still be kind. I got to still be sweet. I don't want to. I don't want to break off my relationship with them. I might be their only hope, and I want them to see nothing but the kind side of of God. I want them to see His good face, or else I'm just being mean. Have you ever heard people act and see and talk that way? You might even feel like you're doing them a favor. Here's the balance. Just like with Samuel, if anybody steps out, you should be the number one person to let them know how valuable they are and how much you love them. But if they continue to purposefully Stand against God. God says, just like he did to Samuel, there has to be a point that you take a stand and you say, I love you, but I cannot be a part of what you are doing on purpose to God. And here is why. Because if you show them that your God is no more important than that, then you're not giving them anything to believe in, number one. 
Because you just sold out your God. Does that make sense? And number two, you in your own heart have chosen to love and idolize this person more than God. You've taken away their chance to see truth. You've, you've just caved in to what's going to ruin their life and maybe their eternity. And you've told God you're not that important to me. So don't think that you're loving them at that point by trying to be too nice. I'm not saying be a jerk and be condescending. I'm saying tell them I will love you to the day I die, but I refuse to stand with you where you are. I'm going to stand over here. And anytime you choose to come back, that's great. And I'll never stop loving you, but I ain't playing your game because my God is real and my God is worth more than that. And if that's what you want to do, you're on your own. And if you're not at some point willing to do that, then you have sold out God. And nobody in this world is going to ever see your light or have your salt to preserve them if you're not willing to do that. So get over this easy breezy gentle Christian and understand that sometimes no matter how much love you do need to show, you've got to be tough and draw a line and say it's time for me to stop crying and it's time for me to step back on God's side or else you're hurting that person and you're destroying your relationship with God. It's especially hard when it's a family or a friend. But you've got to love them. You've got to love them. When your kids mess up, if all you did was, well, I don't want to upset Junior, which that sometimes is the parenting style. Aren't they the ones you just kind of want to hug around the neck until they fall asleep in your arms? <laughs> Sorry. If you love your child, you're going to let that child know they're the center of your world, but I'm not going for that. It's got to be the same way when you love an adult in your life or you don't really love them. You love yourself. You just don't want to make waves with them. You want your life to be easy. You want to be accepted more than you want to help them. Do not use that as a ticket to be condescending and holier than thou and legalistic. Let them see that you truly, genuinely are concerned, but that you will not play the game because God is real. Does that make sense? If we don't get anything else tonight, I hope that you get that because it's something every one of us needs in the world that we're living in. So... All right. Now, Samuel had to get excited about this too. He said, grab your horn of oil, boy. We're getting ready to go get the real king. Now, the first king, God gave them what they wanted. Now, God is going to choose the king that he wanted. But this king is not going to have the easy path that Saul had. Usually, when you follow God's way, it's not the easy path. But the hard path that David's going to get towards the throne is what makes him into the man that he is. So we're going to get to see that story. And I'm so excited to be going through it. Okay, verse 2. This is after he says, hey, get up, stop crying. It's time. We're going to see Jesse. One of his sons is going to be king. Verse 2. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. Does that tell you how bad this relationship has gotten in these few years since the last verse? He's saying, if I go back into town, I've already told him he's going to be replaced. If he has any idea that I'm there to anoint another king or make trouble for him, he's going to kill me. So Saul has no love for Samuel at all anymore. And yet Samuel was still crying over his lost relationship. But the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall appoint, anoint for me the one I name to you. Now we see how bad things are. Um, this thing Saul got so bitter when Samuel was his everything Samuel made him who he was and Samuel loved him like no one else and in just these few short years Saul got so bitter that if he saw Samuel he would have tried to kill him and Samuel knew it so again this is just worth sticking to for a minute uh, because this is why we're walking through scriptures so often, when there's a rift, when there's a problem, even if you're right, we hold on to our pride and our self-worth. Please don't lose me here. And how important we are and what we deserve. Uh, and we let ourselves grow hateful and bitter and condescending. And we'll snap at people because in our own victimized selfishness, 
instead of praying for that person, instead of being broken for that person because they're not right with God, instead of wanting to restore a relationship and having something to do with their life again, it's all about me, how I've been victimized, how wrong I was done, and how I didn't get justice. And so you let this rift come, and you, and you play that rift. And then before long, you're telling anybody and everybody what they did to you so you can justify your position. And every time you see them, you try to avoid them, right? And every time you do speak to them, you want to make sure that even though you're polite, they know you still don't like them. And the longer it goes, the worse it gets. And do you really think that you're glorifying God? And do you ever think that you're going to hear God's voice except for you better straighten up for I jerk a knot in you? Do you think you're helping anybody? Do you think you're showing the face of Jesus Christ? And I see it right here in this church all the time. People that just want to, as covertly as they can, make sure that that person knows that I'm still mad with them. And I don't give a hoot how right you are or how wrong you were done. You're hurting God. You're hurting your relationship with God. And you are never going to help that person heal. And your goal is, no matter what they've done, to care about the person and their restoration to God because it's the only thing that matters in this life. Doesn't mean you become a doormat, but it means you don't play the game. And this is what Saul has done. He's let himself become so bitter that it's grown into this. And what you do is you put yourself in a cage and you grow into what Saul is so that you can't see them without your heart sinking to your feet and becoming a raging monster. And it's one of the worst sins of some of the most well-meaning Christians because nobody else sees it. And you can cultivate it and not look bad in front of somebody else, right? Yes. I've got a fan in my ear. Talk real loud. Um, it says, uh, when Saul says, how can I go? Saul, Samuel says, how can I go? If Saul hears me, he will kill me. But the status that Samuel had in the community, he was, everybody knew he was a prophet of God. But Saul, what would be the repercussions if Saul actually did kill Samuel? Would he the last well, at this point, and we're going to see in the next verse, Samuel has not even been back into town. So, and I'm going to explain what happens. I don't think so. Because when Samuel showed up, the people were scared that he was even there. They really didn't even want him in town. Because Saul was the new kid on the block. Saul had replaced Samuel. And Samuel had not even been in the eyes of the people for some time. And so as soon as Samuel shows up, the people say, hey... What are you doing here? Do you, do you mean good or bad? Why are you even here? So he had lost popularity with the people. Saul, Samuel was replaced by Saul because Samuel was their leader as a judge. Saul became the first king. And, and Samuel stepped down. He was a governing authority over the people, not as a king, but as a judge. When Saul stepped up, he lost that position. He stepped out of it, and he became the spiritual advisor to Saul. He no longer had the governing power that he had had before Saul was king. So it was at that point, he was the right-hand man of Saul, which had been rejected by Saul and had left town for years. And you're going to see in the next verse how he's treated when he steps back. And that's a good question. But Samuel at this point had lost all power and authority over the people. And if you remember, one of the reasons that Saul became king was because the people had rejected Samuel. Samuel stepped down by their request because they didn't want him anymore. So he was not popular with the people, and the whole reason he was not a governing authority anymore was by their choice and their vote. So if it came to between Saul and him, Saul would have probably won. That, that doesn't have a scriptural basis, but based upon the storyline, I think that's how it would have went down. It's a good question. All right. <clears throat> now, Ephesians 4.26, and I will let this go. Ephesians 4.26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. He's saying what I just told you. When you hold on to it, you just open the door and let Satan come in because you've driven God away and you've given a seed. Um, and, of course, this is when Jesus was, was given the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. He says, look, guys, I want you to do good for your enemies because anybody can do good for those that do good for them. But I want you to love your enemies. Here's my problem. We all see that as such a beautiful cliche. 
but we all see it as the cliche that I have the exception to why I don't need to follow it. When are you just going to shut your mouth and say, this is what God said, and he's a pretty smart guy, and maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I don't have an exception, and maybe this is meant for me too. When are you just going to live it instead of saying, well, that's a beautiful verse. I wish people would follow it and start following it yourself. Search your own heart. Don't think about anybody else. Search your own heart, and you ask yourself right now, I promise you somebody in this room is going to find somebody that's put them in a cage because even right now, you got nothing but resentment towards somebody, even if you're justified. You need to get rid of it. God says it's not okay. You're not a doormat. You do need to hold your ground if they're wrong, but you don't hold contempt. You don't try to make them feel bad every time you see them. You try to give them hope. And scriptures are very clear on that. So the biggest thing I could ask you guys in, in the time that we live in is stop letting Scripture be a beautiful cliche and start applying it to your own heart and no one else. And then you'll start seeing change. And I'll tell you what, I learned this the hard way, and I mean it. You learn to do this, and the world will come off of your shoulders. I tried to preach this one time, and about... 30 minutes before I was supposed to preach it. And I didn't even know it. The good Lord let me know that I had my own father in the position that this is exactly how I felt about him. And it destroyed me. And I told the guys I couldn't preach. And then God said, sure you can. Are you brave enough to make it right? And so I had to ask to be excused from work. I didn't leave work, but I left the floor. And I went and I called my dad and I told him everything. And he should have been the one begging forgiveness. And I asked his forgiveness. And um, it, it changed everything in my spiritual life. It changed my heart. And I didn't even know that I had put him in that cage so I'm asking you to do the same because you don't know who you might have in that cage you don't know who might be bringing you grief right now who might be keeping you from being close to God and if you stop and you ask God he will not refuse you he'll show you so don't leave until you do that and if we don't get any further and that's all you get the night was good because it'll change your life so all right. So God told Samuel to go to Bethlehem and uh, with the intent to celebrate an open sacrifice. Because Samuel said, hey, if I go to Bethlehem, I'm going to die, right? This was not a deception. Um, this was God's wisdom. Yes, it would protect Samuel from Saul if he went with the intentions publicly of doing a sacrifice. But it was literally God's plan. And, and then I want you to understand this. One, going to the sacrifice, he invites Jesse. Jesse brings his sons, and that's the way to get all of them together at Jesse's house. And he can see all of their sons at one time because he goes to give the sacrifice. And what they're doing is they're bringing a sacrifice. They don't have a central place of worship yet, right? They don't have a tabernacle anymore. So they have these feasts. The priest will come. He will, all the people will bring animals, they will sacrifice, and if it's a sin offering, you burn the whole sacrifice, right? But if it's a fellowship or a peace offering or a consecration offering, what they do is everybody keeps back part of the animal, they burn part of it to the Lord, they cook part of it, and then they have a dinner, and it's a, it's a literal dinner with Jesus, which wasn't Jesus then, it was God the Father, Yahweh. But they would have a, a fellowship meal, and it was in worship and fellowship with God. So that's what Samuel came into town for. So he goes to celebrate this with Jesse and all of his kids. And, uh, but here's the other, the other reason that God said, I want you to go do the sacrifice and I want this to be private. Not just to protect Saul, I mean Samuel. When Saul was first anointed, did, did God let anybody know? No. God has plans. There are times that, uh, does anybody know, even Jesus when he was walking the earth, does anybody know the day or the hour that God's going to return? No. No, they don't. God keeps it a secret in his wisdom. He has his reasons. 
God wanted to keep David's anointing a secret from everyone. One, to protect David from Saul so that he could grow David until the right time. It was all in God's plan and God's wisdom. So he's like, Samuel, I want you to go under this pretense. I don't want you to let Saul know anything because all it will do is bring evil and wreck my plan. When my time is right and my wisdom is done, I will reveal it. But right now you go and you go quietly. So that's why he was doing it. All right? And, and we really got to learn that. God's not going to reveal everything to us all at once, and we probably don't want him to. Verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? Now, why would the elders say this to the priest? And this is kind of the question that you brought up. And it's, kind of, it's cool that you were thinking that way because right here is where we're going to address it because this this. This brings up the point. Why the contention? Why are they asking the priest who had been their judge for all these years, who had been their man, why are they saying, whoa, whoa, Samuel, what are you doing here? Do you come in peace? That's a weird thing to say to Samuel. But you've got to remember, he's been completely gone for years, and everybody knows the king hates him. Okay? Now, exactly. The last time anybody was there, that's, you just took away note number three. Okay? Here's why, here's why this guy said, hey, do you come in peace? Uh, they knew the animosity because um, the last time Samuel was there, he disrespected the king and he said, hey, king, you're not going to be king anymore very soon. So for all they knew, Samuel was coming with a coup, right? But number two, Mitch, you're very good. Number two, the last time they saw Samuel's face, he stepped in front of the king and literally, like a horror movie, hacked the king's trophy to death in front of the king, dropped the mic, and walked off. And that was the last time they saw him. So if he shows up years later walking into town, what do you, it's like a western. What do you think they're thinking? <laughs> exactly. Good, bad, the ugly, and Samuel's not looking pretty right now. So that's what they're thinking of him. Now, what, what would you be thinking at this point? Exactly the same thing. Scriptures are awesome because they're so honest. Verse 5, and he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. All right. Verse 6, so it was when they came that he looked at, now he's in the house of Jesse now, okay? And Jesse has eight sons. And what's happening is Jesse's parading his sons in front of him. So what, what I'm thinking, it seems in the context of the scripture that Samuel has revealed to at least Jesse and probably the whole family why he's there. He's not just saying, hey, parade your boys in front of me, and then he's going to secretly anoint one of them and not tell them what he's doing. It seems because of their reactions as we read this that they know what he's doing, okay? So it was when they came that he, Samuel, looked at Eliab, this is the oldest of Jesse's sons, and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Um, Eliab was the first. He was the oldest. And he obviously was physically appealing. He is, he's probably a big old boy. Because the first thing Samuel says when he walks up, he's like, Dude, you got to be why I'm here. This has got to be the man, right? So let's see how that plays out. Verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, it's one of the most well-known passages in the Old Testament. God reminds Samuel, he's like, did we not just play this a few years ago with Saul? Did you not just choose the most awesome-looking, biggest, roughest, toughest-looking guy, and look what happened? I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at his heart. He's saying, I'm going to base this on what I see that you don't. And I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot of men and women with, with this attitude, probably secretly a lot of times, sometimes not, and they do think they're God's gift to the world, like I was saying. Uh, and they're often passed by when they could do so much for God for that very reason. They do have a lot of gifts. They do have a lot of things they could bring to the table. But rather than serving God in awe and reverence and humbleness, 
rather than serving God because they want to please Him because of all He's done for them. Listen to me, please. Rather than seeing God's people as wonderful, broken, in need, children of God, that they could serve, they say, look all I got to bring at the table, Lord. I'm here. Use me. Let me create this big ministry. Let let me show you what I can do. God's like, I don't need you. I need somebody that loves my people the way I do. I need somebody that really, really wants to please me like I want to please you, be with you. I created you for fellowship. I want you to want me. That's all I want. And we don't get that. And you remember in Luke 14, the parable of the banquet, where Jesus is saying, when you come in, don't sit down at the head of the table like you think you're all that, because then the host is going to have to say, you need to get up. That's not your seat. He says, go and sit at the end. And then when the host decides, he can say, hey, my friend, you're awesome. Come up here and sit next to me. God's saying, let that be my call. And you just shut up and go sit at the end of the table and be happy you're here. But we so often don't want to do that. And, and this, is, this is any of you that plan to be a leader in any way, whether it be at work, whether it be the leader of your family, whether it be a leader of a Sunday school class or a pastor or whatever. What I have found and what scriptures back up is the person that is most desiring of and loving the position of leadership is usually the one least qualified to hold it. And I see it at work so often. The people that just live and breathe and strive to be the next team leader or group leader are usually the ones you just want to choke out when they get there because it's all about them and how far they can advance and they really don't care about anybody. They care about their position. Okay, I want you to listen close to this. Being a leader is simply a tool that gives you more power to serve and love other people. Did you get that? And if you don't have the heart that you are the servant and the lover of the people that you are over, you don't need any kind of leadership because leadership is just a tool to better serve those people. To see what they have to bring and to bring it out of them. To care about them. To meet their needs. To be their humble servant. And let them shine. And become one together. That is leadership. Not, look who I am, I know it all, I don't need you. That is the world's way. And Jesus was very clear to say, I I am the Messiah and I came to serve you. And if you plan in any way to be anything to me, then humble yourself and be underneath other people's feet and love and serve them and then you'll be ready to be a leader with me. We got to get that. That's not just, again, it's not a cliche. It's a mindset. And you can't just create it through legalistic humbleism. Humbleism. Humbleness. You have to genuinely get the heart that, that I, I want to help and love and serve other people. And if God decides to move me up into a position so that I can do that better, great. And if he keeps me doing nothing but scrubbing toilets, then I am pleasing my God. And who is the only person that I care to please? I will do it with all of my heart. And I will not care who sees me. I will not do it for the eyes of man. I will do it knowing that my God is looking at me. And if your employer doesn't appreciate you. And they treat you bad. And they don't pay you enough. Then you work the best you can anyway. And shut your mouth. Because you're working for God. You're not working for them. And we really need to get that today. (coughs) Walking through scriptures hurts doesn't it? And we're not going to make it to the end. All gone, me and my long windedness. All right. I think honestly, this might be a good place to stop because I want to spend some time on the next few verses. They are awesome, they are powerful. We probably need to stop right here. So, what I will do, we'll start in verse 8. We've been given so much to think about already. One, take this, take this. I I would love for you to go back with these things in your mind and read these verses for yourself and let God speak to you in ways that only he can. Uh, When someone has done you wrong, remember what Samuel did. He loved him. He was heartbroken. He prayed for him. He didn't go away angry and hateful. Number one, God calls you to be that way when people hurt you. Um, Number two, remember that when you mess up, 
That's God's mentality. He's not going to be the one to cross back over because he didn't cause the rift. He's wanting so desperately. He is mourning for you to cross the distance and come home. Because if it's not you to cross the distance, then your heart didn't change and it wouldn't be any good if you're reunited. Does that make sense? Did you hear what I just said? If my wife and I split up because she was sleeping with someone else and then she comes back, but she doesn't change her heart about sleeping with other people, does it really matter that she closed the rift between us? No, because we still have the same problem. And that's why if she hasn't changed her mind, I'm surely not going to run to her and try to make it right because she's just going to do it again, right? And don't worry, my wife is not doing that. Okay. <laughs> Jesus is the same way. Everything in him wants you to come back and wants to be close to you. And he is mourning you. He's, he really, truly stands at the door when you don't want him. The rift was caused by you. But he cannot come back to you even though he wants to. Because your heart has to change or there's no reason for him to meet up with you again. Because you're not going to love him. You're just going to ridicule him. That's why you have to cross the path. You have to cross the desert and come back. And understand when you do, he's waiting. And secondly, what you got to get out of this, you stay and you love and you always let that person know what they mean. But there has to come a time that you tell them, no matter how much I love you, I will stand with my God. And then lastly, what we have learned very clearly here, whatever is in your heart, anyone that you hold bitterness against, even if they don't know it, you got to deal with it. You got to quit just playing pretty scriptures. You got to just decide this really is me and I need to do something about it. And as long as we listen to preaching and say that was good preaching and that's a beautiful verse to hang on my refrigerator and we don't get real with nobody but us and God, even if nobody else knows that you did it, you will never ever leave your lukewarm Christianity. And what does Jesus say he wants to do with your lukewarm Christianity? He would rather you be a jerk face standing against him on a picket line because at least the world knows where you stand and you're not making a mockery of him. Guys, the, the rest of the world is having no problem standing behind what they believe they love. Why are you having a problem standing behind what you say you love? Just, if you go ahead and step out and get branded, it's not hard anymore. Why don't you get branded for Jesus? And don't do it self-righteously. Do it in love as a servant to the people that hate you. But go ahead and let them start hating you. And don't back down. And love them. But tell them you will not cross the line just to make them happy again. I don't care if it's your brother, your sister, your spouse, your mom, your dad. I don't care who it is. You tell them I love you. And if you're into that, that's okay. But I'm not going to stand beside you while you do it. Because my God is real. And my God is love. And I'm going to show you that I love him. Hoping that you will love him one day too. That's what God has called us to do. It's time to get real, guys. All right, we're going to get into the best part next week. But uh, I think we, we spent our time well. Uh, think about the things that we just talked about as we stand for worship. Altars are always open. It's wonderful to come down and show God your humility, but you can stand right there and tell God everything in your heart. I promise you there's somebody in here that needs to bring something to God tonight. There's never a time that I bring a sermon to you that I don't apply it to myself first, and I got a lot of battle scars, so I ain't looking down at anybody. But uh, if it touched my heart, there's got to be somebody in here who feels the same way. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It's the wisdom and the love goes so far beyond anything we would want to write. Help us to just realize we're not all that and our society's not all that and we're not all wise and that you are awesome and that we can trust your word. And then help us, Lord, to just give ourselves to you because we don't even have the will to do. Help us to say we just, we don't have the will, but we want you. And then help us to give ourselves to you and let you do it through us. Bring to mind every, every person that we need to truly forgive and truly love, and truly pray for, and reach out to, and every person that we have to stand firm against so that they can see that you're real. And Lord, I pray you'd make every person in here, if nothing else happens tonight, 
walk out of here a little more humble, a little more serving, even to the crazy world that hates us. Because we are just like the crazy world that hates us. We've just found you and you have forgiven us and you have shown us ways that are not even naturally ours. And let us realize that anything good we have is not even us. So we can go to our brothers and sisters out in the world humbly, Lord. Let us see how much you love us. Let us come to you unashamed, knowing that you've just been waiting. Not angry, but anxious. We love you, we praise you. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen.